Okay, hello, hello everyone. I think we're live, we're streaming now. Okay, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dan Frost. I'm the Learning Technology Lead in the New Product Department at Cambridge Assessment English. But today I'm representing a collaboration between Cambridge Assessment and the Judge Business School. This collaboration is Shape Education. Shape Education has been running cross-sector events over the last 18 months. And we bring, we bring together people to talk about and to think about how to accelerate change in education. You can find out more about Shape Education at shapeeducation.org and also on the Cambridge Assessment website. So we're delighted to bring you the second Shape Live today. This is the second in our series of live streamed events and we'll be looking at some of our outline principles for the future of education. You can read about these on our website uh, at um, Cambridge Assessment. Now, let's just get into what we're going to talk about today. So, we're not going to talk about the specific principles. We're going to look at some quotes that we put on a, on a blog post a little while ago, where people were quite well-known people were saying that things like textbooks and schools and curriculum were things of the past. Uh, Bill Gates, a famously voracious reader who goes on week-long reading holidays with like two or three feet in books, physical books, was saying textbooks are a thing of the past. So which is it? Textbooks are a thing of the past or big stacks of books and they're okay? It's confusing, but we're not actually going to engage with those statements at all because that kind of false dichotomy is a bit of a distraction. The future is probably a mix. The future is probably not one or the other. So today we're going to ask the question, what are the faster horses of education? We'll get to that in a minute. Um, the format of this will be the same as last time. So we'll have a couple of speakers who I'll introduce in a minute and then a Q&A uh, with questions from you. So please do drop questions into the chat, which I think is here. First time on YouTube, I think it's there. Um, before we do that, if you could do, a, do me a favor. So if you could go to the top of your screen and copy the link uh, and paste it into your Teams, uh, Teams chat or or Yammer or LinkedIn or Facebook, and just invite anyone who you think will be interested in the discussion today or about any of the topics that Shape Education is looking at. So I think there's a question already being posted into the chat view. I'm, I'm off in Zoom world, you're in YouTube world, so I'm living slightly in the future for you. So you should have seen a question. Um, if you were going to remove something, remove things from education, what would you take out? Now, for the purposes of this thought experiment, there's no limits whatsoever. The reason is that when you take something out, it, it, asks, it begs the question of what was the role of it? What was the problem it was trying to solve in the first place? So while you put some things in there, uh, I'm going to talk about faster horses before we get to our speakers. So Henry Ford almost certainly didn't say, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would, would have said faster horses. Turns out, according to a Harvard Business Review article about, from about a decade ago, that this phrase cropped up around 2002, um, but it didn't come from Henry Ford. We're going to ignore that, the fact that it didn't come, and we're going to use it anyway, um, because it certainly rings true. There's a human tendency to improve things by building a better version of what was there before. This is echoed in a, in a study that was mentioned in Nature and The Economist recently, where researchers found that there's a human tendency to add to something or reinforce it rather than removing things. And removing important things like the horses can seem counterintuitive, surely you've wrecked the system. But the point was not the horses, the point was getting from A to B. So if we collect these ideas, the apocryphal faster horses and the attendance and the tendency to add rather than remove to solve a problem it can make you wonder if we need to correct for our human bias are we building faster horses but not really aware of it so what happens when you remove things well the last year has seen us remove quite a lot because of lockdown and although we wouldn't want to necessarily run the experiment for longer, it was just a year and education is lots of years tied together. So it begs the question of if you ran it for a decade, what would you discover that you can do differently? So what kind of questions end up? I'd be interested to see um, what, what you think. We're already getting some comments through, so that's really cool. Um, but things like the school day, the school year, classrooms, these things that are so obvious and yet they're not the whole of education, they're a mechanic to enable it. So to help us think about this, we've got a couple of guests. And actually these are 
repeat shape uh, speakers, so it's nice to have them back. So I'm delighted to first introduce Maria Cas Zuberia, which I think I got your name right. Um, so briefly to introduce her, Maria has been a teacher and teacher trainer for over 30 years. She's worked with children, teenagers, adults at different educational levels and institutions. She's currently a full-time professor of the University of Colima in Mexico, and she studied at the universities of Exeter and Southampton. And what Maria is going to talk to us about is within this big global experiment that was lockdown, she ran her own experiment. So Maria, if you're there. Yes, I'm here. Um, I live in Mexico. I live in the west, west side of Mexico in the western coast, basically very close to the Pacific Ocean. And I have two children, school age children. One is in fourth grade and one is in sixth grade. And when the lockdown happened, it became very difficult for us to continue teaching at the university and catering for our kids at school. And as I started speaking with them, we, we are very close to four other families. And we started speaking about it and it, it didn't seem like it was going to become any better. Um, that was about a year ago. So we decided to create our own, like a tribal school, like a one-room school. And we got together 10 children, and we hired two teachers to, to help them learn. Basically, we have 10 kids um, ranging from six years old to 12, 13 years old now. And they, were st they started learning together. And as Dan asked me, what would I take away from education in order to help them? I guess one of the main things that we did take away, it is the idea of having exams, like the idea of getting a grade. In Instead, we started working together and children um, started sharing their own learning. Um, can, I, can I share some images of what is, um, what is happening at, the, at our experiment? Let me share. Okay, sorry. Never mind. Uh, so we, we, we started taking away um, the idea of getting a uniform. In Mexico, it's very common that school children have to wear a uniform and they have to, to do exactly like in a little box. They, they have to get up at certain hour and at certain hour, they have to jump from one uh, topic of the curriculum to the next without really consolidating their learning. So we, we decided that it was not a good idea for our own children, particularly since um, they were not happy and they were um, getting um, depressed and not able to, to really learn. So we, we, what started out as a, a way of getting them to comply with the school curriculum it became an experiment with our own kids. And now we're thinking about starting our own school and continuing next, and next um, school year together with the kids um, learning, okay? Um, Dan, can I share my, my screen, please? Uh, yeah, 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 I think... Um... Yeah, you ought to be able to do that. It'd be great to see. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you see it now? Uh, yes. yes, I think so. So these are the kids that we, we got together. These are the children. They are like six years old. We have first graders. We have um, second graders. We have um, fourth graders, sixth graders, and secondary school children all together. And they do things according to their interests. For instance, in this picture, they wanted to find out how 
Colima is a, it's a small agricultural state in Mexico. And they wanted to find out how um, crops were farmed. So one day, um, the grandfather, one of the kids, took them to their fields and showed them the, the way, you know, the, the, the um, crops were farmed and, and harvested and everything. So they learned firsthand according to their interests. Uh, one of the main components of arts, we, we do emphasize a lot with arts, you know, music and dance and painting and, and even sewing, you know, here's a, one of the painting classes. Um, her name, um, she's one of the mothers at the, at the project and she's a painter. And so she's the one who teaches them painting. Aside from the two uh, main teachers that we hired, um, the, the school parents, they, we go there once a week and deliver or share something with them. And one of the, the main things that we, we took away in order for them to learn better is we took the boundaries of ages and grades. She's in second grade and he's in first grade and they were working together with the, with the eat well plate, like learning um, about uh, better nutrition and they were building it together. They decided on the images and they put together a well plate, uh, eat well plate with pieces of fabric. Uh, he's doing a puppet He's building a puppet in order to make a point in one of the history classes. And he's sewing, he, he's sewing his puppet. He's, he's putting it all together. So the, it's the ability or it's the, the, the idea that children learn based on their own interests. Uh, we do have a big component in reading and and uh, storytelling and things and that's part of the curriculum which is not really part of the mexican curriculum at, at some points they do work together on particular aspects even despite the fact that there are different age groups they they do work on a topic but they work it all at, at a different level Here they're they're helping each other learn about the different the the um, natural um, habitats of animals and starting from fungi animals uh, plants and everything. So they they built these um, these uh, cards that they put together and then they had to put them you know match them. It's kind of like a matching game but they were all working to build or to construct that knowledge. Here they're working on a different aspect. You know, they're all images on, on things that they do every day at school, you know, at their, they call it the little school. And one, now that the lockdown is almost over in Mexico, or at least there's been a lot of talk about going back to schools like regularly, um, they don't want to go back. One of the main things is, for instance, um, this girl over here, every time she listens, like the, the mere idea of saying, oh, well, you may go back to school, and she cries, and she cries and cries and cries because she doesn't want to go back to the regular classroom. And they're, they're being very, um, they're happy and they are willing to learn. They're willing to, to experiment. They're willing to, we noticed how we have put them in a box, how we have, um, the school system has uh, make them fit something. And now that they're, they're away from it, they're actually doing much better. They do take the exams from the, the educational system because we need to get the, the proof of their learning in some way. And they, are, they do much better than their classmates are doing, like the regular classmates. 
So we are going to continue with this experiment in, but we are going, we are planning on introducing uh, or playing more on the, on the strengths from the little school, you know, um, we want to include for next semester and um, like a strong research component. For instance, what I mean is that we're going to help them uh, develop their interests on a research base in a way that they learn in a holistic way. Um, they will create like a little business um, of their interest. Now, for instance, we, we are talking about, they are talking about growing different crops or little uh, vegetables, like having a vegetable patch and selling it and producing it and water it and things like that. And we are, we are proposing having some kind of like um, animal uh, caring business that they can sell for their neighbors around the place. We were very lucky because we, they are working in an old hacienda in Colima, which is a beautiful place. It is a very nice building. They get to, to dress any way they want to. They, they can go bare feet if they want to be bare feet. They can, and they, they learn according to their interests, basically. <laughs> And that's part of our experiment. I don't know if you have any questions. There's, there's some questions. Um, thank you, Maria. That was that was really lovely. I, I, when we caught up earlier in the week, um, you told me about the little girl that, that doesn't want to let go of her school because it's hers. I think there's something interesting about yours. You behave totally differently towards them. The, and if, if it's your school, then you're going to treat it quite differently. We've got quite a few questions coming through, um, but We'll come back to those in a minute. Uh, for now, for now, we're going to go over to Ralph Tabera, who is again joining us for the second time at Shape. Um, he has more than forty years' experience in the school sector, in higher education and government. Um, so much that I've had to trim down the bio for, for time, but you can see the whole thing on our website. He was Director General of the Schools in England between two thousand and six and two thousand and nine. He has been Chief Operating Officer and CEO of Chems Education in two thousand and twelve. He established the first of his own businesses, supporting investors, operators, governments, and schools, and now owns and chairs four educational businesses working in many countries across the world. Um, so, Ralph, on the topic of remake of removing all the faster horses or your spin on the question yeah over to you thank you thank you dan and um i love maria's example it's it's I, I, maybe i shouldn't label it but uh that kind of community project it's very interesting at the moment how almost every week i'm meeting another one of these around the world as covid has sort of broken the model of how education uh, works and people are experimenting with new models and they're coming up with fantastic solutions. Um, I was talking to some management consultants who'd retired recently, and two or three of those, we were just doing a, a webinar to talk about changes in education, and a couple of them were running community projects as well, the sort of grandfather figures. And it's, it's, it's very exciting and very impressive, Maria. Um, I'd love to come and see more of it. But what, what this speaks to me of is that um, one of the, chat contributions would say if we're going to remove anything from education let's take down the walls let's let's recognize that the western model the you know the uk us europe model that we've had of education has been very highly uh, corporatized um it's a it's a very connected system there is a curriculum there are there it is organized differently for every year it can be broken down into what people do every term every week every day it leads towards an end of year test or examination the curriculum and assessment are very closely associated um all the students of the same age go at the same uh same pace really all the way through in cohorts and the whole thing is just highly corporatized people sometimes talk about about it as a, a Victorian industrial model. It's not, it's, it's much more modern than that. It's been bureaucratized. It's been uh, you know, rendered in a, a shape 
corporate shape by technology and by consultants. And it's, it's, it's a rigid system. And it's got to the point now where when we think about the future, unfortunately, we, we find it very difficult to break out of the kind of problems we've been wrestling with and kind of dialogue and conversations because the walls are so high, it's created that echo chamber. It's, it's, it's the effect. And then people like Maria are coming along and saying, hey, you don't need to do it like this. And, and if you look at just the critical, some of the critical workflows and arrangements in schools, um, the exam system now, uh, you know, in the UK are very, very strong, strong exam systems around doing end of, you know, these terminal exams and things like GCSEs and A-levels. Um, that system is broken as, a, as, as an annual age-related system because all the old arguments about if you got an A-level 10 years ago and you get one now, it's broadly the same thing. Well, it's not anymore. It's broken. It's gone. These last two years, it hasn't worked that way. I mean, it won't, we won't be able to do that in future. So we've got to, you know, I think, remove the walls and, and they're tumbling down anyway. Um, a real signal for me of, of how imperative it is we do something different is the questions we're asking now. Um, if we just stay within our walled garden, the, the answers are wrong. Um, if, if you ask a basic question like, what is excellence in schools? Then um, if you work within our current echo chamber, then it's about schools having Ofsted-like compliance, um, really good standards, really good classroom teaching, really good systems around that, really good safeguarding of children. And it's, 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 it's kind of all there for you to copy. Um, but actually, if I think about the excellent education that I see around the world, if somebody genuinely asked me what is the best thing that I see, then I would pick out just two examples. Um, to start with, I could pick out dozens, but I'd pick out, for example, Gordonston School in, in Scotland, which is a, a private school. A, um, a, 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 it's a school working with a lot of resources, but they've organised their school in a way that other uh, other private international schools haven't done. They've fundamentally built the school around experiential education for the children like Maria, getting them out doing things. Their days are based on, let's give children an outdoor experience, an outdoor challenge and life, a set of life challenges. They don't start with the, the, you know, the, the curriculum and, and design everything to add on to that. It's as extra curriculum. This is what they give children. They give children challenges to, you know, climb the local mountains, to go out uh, on Arctic sailing boats and navigate and captain them. They take children out beyond their normal experiences and get them to find their character and the, the extras in them by putting them in these challenging situations. They also demand of their children that children take part in voluntary service. So for years, the school has been providing the local fire service to its community, the fire service, uh, along with professionals, the Coast Guard, the, they're doing the, um, the first aid at all the sports events in the area. They, this isn't optional for the children, this is compulsory. And it's, it's, a, it's a kind of excellence that when Ofsted kind of model comes in, it treats those real excellent differentiating characteristics as a sideshow. It's, it's, oh, it's nice to have that as well, but let's talk about the other. And I think that's missing what excellence is. Another example of excellence for me would be a school I, I love in, 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 um, in the Middle East, which is a poor end of a, of a wealthy city, but it, the cost of education there is about £1,500 per pupil. That's about a third to a quarter of of the uh, the expenditure in the UK, and they have five thousand children in a poor facility school. Classroom size is about two thirds the size of what the West is used to. The children are learning in their second language. They don't speak English when they they start, or they have they're learning it in the family, but they don't have English as their first language. And all the teachers are teaching English as their second language as well. They don't come from, and yet this school has it does the GCSEs, it does the A levels. And its results are way better than the, the national average in the UK. And that comes from the ambition in the children and the commitment of not wealthy families to giving their children everything they can in discussion and growth at home and extension and support. There's, there's schools full of love and attention to individuals, which goes way beyond what the models of education that we're talking about being excellent are. And I think we should stop and look at these things, but it's not just, 
what's uh, what's excellence. Other questions are, are hard to answer now. Um, in our country, when we come to shape events, if we're too UK centric or Western centric, we'll ask questions like what's our problem? And maybe we'll debate, I don't know, how many subjects to do at GCSE or what size the pupil premium should be or um, it, what, how do we close the gap between the disadvantaged and advantaged communities? Those are important problems in a way, but they're not the big problems in the world. The big problems in the world are still that we've not got hundreds of thousands, hundreds sorry, of millions of children in school. We've still not got affordable solutions in education in many parts of the world. And um, you know, the, the real problems are, are getting more investment in education. Governments are, in, are increasingly demonstrating they can't afford it all. So answers have to come from private investment, from communities taking responsibilities in these areas. And we, we should be talking about what are these affordable school models for the future? And, and that takes me into the, you know, the next question, what's innovation? And I then look around the world and the, the innovation is not talking within our countries about how we use a new technology. Innovation is in businesses like uh, Sabis in the Lebanon, which is creating schools in a box, which can be opened all around the world. And the school works and is dependable and gets results because it runs um, for them and is considerably cheaper and is considerably more um, authentic in terms of its assessment. They really work at these things. If we looked at that model from, from our position, we'd probably be frightened of it as too rigid and maybe too much assessment, but actually we need to engage with it. We need to think about it because it's providing reliable, affordable solutions in other parts of the world. And so this goes on. Even now, we're so locked in our answers that, We've had a year and a half of COVID and we've been talking about um, going and looking at virtual schooling, but how many people actually looked at the models of virtual schools that already existed around the world and how many just decided to try and sort it out locally in terms of their own solutions. And I work with our Academy Middle East and K-12 in the US, which have virtual tool solutions. They didn't get people coming to them to say, what have you learned from 10, 20 years of development in this area? People just chose to work within their own echo chamber, looking for a variation on the solution, which worked for them. We've got to remove walls and stop thinking about, changing my metaphor, about just how do we make our current horses go faster? We've got to, we've got to look differently. I'll leave this with a last, a last thought, because as I travel around the world, people love English, British educators. Um, they love the, the quality that there has been in our system. They don't like all of the ways we do it, um, but the, the real strengths of the UK system um, continually everywhere I go are the English language teaching for obvious reasons. And also our understanding and, and ability in assessment. It's, and I think this is where you're in a very interesting thing, Dan, you don't pay me to say this, but there you are working with Cambridge in, in language and in the assessment areas, you have the best reputation in the world because you've innovated, you've taken things out, you've, you've created new curriculum and new opportunities for people. People like to be associated with that. But here's the challenge for us in the UK, for you and for assessment. As the walls come down, we don't need the terminal model we've had in the past, but nor do we need anarchy. Uh, we need systems which help children to get credentials and to grow and to prove their worth. So part of taking the walls down is taking our technical skills in designing assessments so that they can work on a different workflow. They don't have to be in school at the end of the year at a certain age. It could be done in smaller units of assessment, like a driving test, which children could take when they're ready. And if they they could go, as Maria was saying, children of different ages can work together. If that's, if we can uncouple our bits of our system, which many pieces are strong, if we can start to make them available in different combinations to people so that the institution and the front line can work in a more flexible way, then I think we're gonna get some pretty exciting and new solutions. And we could go back to arguing about what real excellence, what real, what real solutions, what real innovation. Is, is all about. So nothing drastic. All I want to do is take down all the walls. 
Fantastic. The, with these shape events, with these fireside chats and Q&As, I always end up with way more questions than I've got time to ask. And I had prepared some, but I think um, we'll go to the, the questions in the chat. Um, so, uh, Ralph, let's go back to you first. Um, someone's asked, well, how can we standardise excellence? The, we can't standardise excellence. Uh, it's a mistake. Uh, we can standardize, we standardize good. Um, and there's, there's everything, good reason to standardize good and help create a floor, can create acceptable standards. But the, the problem is that the, the best is the enemy of the good. To try to standardize excellence is, is to suggest it has one shape. And I'm sorry, I've been in education a long time the best places that excite me are trying to do education in ways which are different from each other. And I, I, as I say, I don't want anarchy. I don't want just any innovation for its own sake. But if people put together a coherent approach to education, which excites the children, helps them find their identity, their meaning, which works for their family, which makes the whole education experience then connected in the family and something everybody's contributing to, you get ambition within it, you get character, you get personality, you get difference then you have a different set of forces. Don't standardize excellence and tell me at the end of the day that that's what I have to do. Give me what good looks like and then I'll beat that if I can work with the front line and get towards uh, a solution that we create which fits the different circumstances in different contexts. Excellent. I'm being prompted by one of the people who in the background to ask a question, but I'm not clear which one it is. So um, if they can post it to me in the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, Maria, I, I just on this excellence point, I, I wanted to ask you that, so Ralph raised the question of what is excellence. Um, in your new school, how would you think about that and how would you measure it and would you? Um, well, I, I, already, I think I already mentioned um, the little school has to still comply with the national curriculum because we do eventually want our children to be able to attend the university and to attend a higher education. However, um, I think in, in our case, I agree with um, Ralph when he says that excellence cannot be put into one shape. For instance, we have a child that is excellent at um, music, but he needs uh, help with uh, Spanish grammar, for instance. So there, there are different varieties or forms or shapes of excellency within the little school. But the, the, the trick has been helping them play on their strengths, but at the same time, building up their, their weaknesses or their areas of opportunity within themselves. Um, one of the major components or the major things that we found out as parents and as um, educators involved in the project, it is that the school system doesn't um, really help them develop those soft skills that they, they will need eventually. The soft skills in the sense that they are not very good um, the children or the students who go through the school system in Mexico, when they finish their basic education, they're not that good at um, speaking in public or addressing other people or knowing how to conduct themselves in certain situations. They, they, they don't have very good um, reading comprehension skills so those are the things that we are trying to help them build better. One of the major um, aspects that we're emphasizing is that a child has to consolidate the learning. You cannot jump from one topic to the next, to the next, to the next, unless this child has uh, really mastered the basics. And then it goes on to learn a little bit, to construct, to build, to their, their own knowledge to, to become better at it. Eventually they do, um, I saw some of the questions there about the national like standardized testing. 
what we found out in this year, we, I, I think I told you before, um, this uh, school year has been like our chaos. It has been like uh, trying to figure out what we wanted and how we wanted it done. And um, we found out the kids, because um, we didn't have the, the official recognition for the Ministry of Education, our kids are still enrolled in four different schools and they are complying with the exams at those schools. Without having this very strict curriculum, they are doing much better than the ones that are still following the strict curriculum at those schools um, online, for instance. They, they do have um, Mexico uh, measures the learning from one to 10. And uh, our kids or the kids at the school, they, none of them have uh, lower than a nine, for instance, in those exams. They get, none of them had, has gotten any lower grade on those exams than nine points without really having to be in the box. The, that's that's what we we have found out you know it, it's working for them the idea of helping each other it is working for them the idea of building and constructing knowledge so i guess excellence for us would be um our our main goal is for them to instill in them the love for learning the 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 one to learn more, the one to research, the one to, I want to find out how this is happening. You know, that, that thing has gone out in our kids before, you know. That's very, very interesting. Maria, I want to stay with you. There's a, um, there's a question in the chat um, that, uh, that says, looking differently and teaching things of value to prepare kids for the world is great but how receptive are parents to this in an old world that refuses to die? And so at a recent SHAPE event, um, one of the things that came out was the, the, the idea that parents want education to change and to experiment and to be different, but not with their kids. They can experiment with someone else's, but not with their own. Um, can you, talk, when we spoke the other day, Maria, you, you, you said that you wouldn't have dared do this without the the pandemic because it gave you kind of air cover to, to give you the opportunity to do it and um, can you talk about that and also talk about maybe the things that people are scared of removing from education well um yes uh, that's actually true um beforehand we used to dream um in the, in the school the little school four of the parents we are educators four out of the ten parents we are educators and we, you know, from time to time we get together and we talk about how we would love to have a school that was, um, you know, fulfilling those, those, um, those ideas that our children are willing and, and able to learn by themselves and according to their interests, but it still function quite well in a higher education system. But um, we, we always talked about it and we never dared. And then the pandemic came and I'm going to say something that my, one, my youngest one said um, to me about a year ago. He was um, in front of his computer taking his online class about May last year, I guess. And every time I turned around, he was under the table playing with Legos. You know, he was playing with the, his toys under the table. And I kept saying, Nicolás, you have to stand up. You know, your teacher is looking at you. You have to be polite and you have to pay attention. And it's like, at one point, he really got fed up with me. And he looked at me and said, you think this thing is school? This is not school. Do you see me here with my friends and talking to them and really learning? This is, this is not really learning. I don't have to be here. The teacher, uh, you know, spends so much time taking role in attendance and all these things, you know, it's boring. I don't want to be here. I don't want to learn like this. So that trigger in our heads, you know, so I talked to my friends and I said, well, what, how are your kids doing? And they're like, no, no, 
he, he cannot sit still. We, we have a fight every day to get them to sit down and try to do all these things. So the pandemic in a way has been good for us in, in this sense, you know, because it helped us um, safely or in our, to, to experiment in this chaos here with our own children, because whatever we're doing, it's much better than what was happening for them, to them last year, last semester, I guess. That's re really interesting. So um, I can see there's quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, I want to ask uh, if you're watching, um, I was meant to ask this before and I've been prompted twice um, to do this. Um, yeah, post again what you would take out of education. I think um, we we'll probably won't be able to get through all of the, the comments and, and questions today, but it will be interesting to look at the whole whole chat and reflect on it and uh, help us prepare for future events. Um, so uh, I think there's a couple of questions um, which, Ralph, I'd like to point to you, which is if you're looking at these more kind of community schools like Maria's, how do you, how do you scale that up? How do you scale up the, the, the sense of community and ownership? Um, and the and second part, the question here, which is, would you say that key elements of education still exist, like curriculum, pedagogy, assessment? Or are, they, are they still there, but they're, they're different? And what does that look, look like? So Ralph, um, question for you. Yeah, you, you've thrown at me a question, a scaling question is a question that's a corporate question. Once you've got your model, you've worked out your product, and you've worked out you know, the standards you're trying to achieve, then how do we scale it and get it out everywhere? I think it's a, I'm, I think we're, we're arguing about actually enabling more experimentation to take place and to learn from it. And, and in that experimentation, it's very important that we do stick to curriculum and assessment and pedagogy because those are strengths. Just what we have to, we have to start doing is, is uncoupling them because they become very, very tightly connected, you know, to the point where we're actually doing things which don't work under pandemic and don't work for parents. Um, and let me just take the one example, which is exams. At the moment, the terminal exam for every child in, in the UK, a GCSE at the age of 16, um, is, is broken. It's, it can't go on. And uh, we'd be lying to parents if we said to them that the, your child this year gets a standard, um, which is fair, because some of them haven't been able to study as much as others. So that's why they've been called off. But in future years, there'll be other pandemics or there'll be other difficulties, which will also create that unevenness. The children are of actually different ages when they do it. So why are we saying they're all the same age and we're comparing like with like? And we've broken, as I said, the link with with past generations of children at 16 who had better opportunities to hit these, uh, to hit the grades. And actually what we did therefore was change the grades. So the system is broken. Parents cannot have confidence. It's the same gold standard. The, the change we need to make is, is we don't throw assessment out. What we do is we, we, we do bring it down to maybe three tests or a set of five that students could do when they're ready in order to get a GCSE. And the teacher and the parent and the child can choose when that takes place. And therefore it doesn't matter if the pandemic comes and it shuts everybody down, at least they've got the modules they've already got and they can take the other ones when they're ready for it. It doesn't matter if they're 16 or 17, it's just them adding these qualifications. We all should be looking uh, at the assessment system which will make that possible and then once we've, we've, we've uncoupled these things, it's easier for other people to put the curriculum and assessment back in different orders, or even to you know, have more of a parental contribution at home or less of one. It can be adaptable, but we've, we've just got it too rigid now. So um, take some of these off, admit that the system is broken, needs a shift, but we're so frozen at the moment that there's not even a discussion about the fact it's broken. Um, and we're continuing, therefore, I, I feel, to lie to parents about how, how strong the system is for the future. We've got to come clean. And um, it's not immediately about scale. It is about taking some of these pieces out so that then it can be put together again. And the solutions that start to work differently well, those can be scaled. Lots of interesting points and there's more questions than we've got time to get through. So um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this time. So thank you 
Ralph, thank you, Maria, for those ideas and discussion. Uh, thanks to the team behind the scenes for keeping this going and sorry to them for not reading the question at the right time. And thanks to everyone for, for joining us for this second live stream. We have another coming up, I think, in about a month. So if you follow us here, or on LinkedIn, where I think some of you found us anyway, or sign up at Shape Education, where you can hear about other events that we're running um, over the next few months. And also we'll be releasing a report from a previous Shape uh, Education event, which was looking at what the blockers are to changing education and how those might be unblocked. So, um, yep, do get involved if you'd like to. Have a lovely rest of the day and thanks for joining us. <laughs>